Well, good morning. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. We're glad you joined us on this first Sunday of Advent. My name is Jonathan Britton, and let's begin. We're going to light our first candle this morning here. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel. Isaiah 9, 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And good morning. If you're able, let's stand, but let's lift our voices to our wonderful Savior. Come, thou long-expected Jesus, born to set thy people free from our fears and sins relieved. Us. Let us find our rest in thee. Israel's strength and consolation, hope of all the earth thou art, dear desire of every nation, joy of every longing heart. Born thy peace to deliver born a child and yet a king born to reign in us forever now thy gracious kingdom bring by thine own eternal spirit rule in all our hearts alone by thine all sufficient Raise us to thy glorious throne. In Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man. Coming with the clouds of heaven, he approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Blessing and honor, glory and power be unto thee.
Lord of days. That helps get our blood circulating a little bit. In Acts 4, verses 11 and 12, Jesus is the stone the builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Jesus, name above all names, beautiful Savior, glorious Lord. Blessed Redeemer, living Word, Jesus, name above all names, beautiful Savior, glorious Lord. Isaiah 42, 5 through 9. This is what God the Lord says, the creator of the heavens, who stretches them out, who spreads out the earth with all that springs from it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles, to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not yield my glory to another or take or my praise to idols. See, the former things have taken place and new things I declare. Before they spring into being, I announce them to you.
please be seated. At this time, we will collect our tithes and offerings. guys that's great how can we keep them let's pray dear heavenly father in light of all you've done for us how can we keep from singing but most importantly that you sent your son that you loved us so much that you sent your one and only son we now humbly return a small portion of the many blessings you poured upon us use them to further your kingdom and to bring glory to your name amen this time, turn to somebody and say, Happy Advent.
Good morning, everyone. Boy, did we have two handsome candle lighters this morning or what? Thanks, guys. I'm going to ask that the kids club be excused. Miss Beth is going to take the kids off upstairs. So hope you have a great time together up there. Let's bow together in prayer as they're on their way out. Psalm 66, shout for joy to God all the earth. Sing the glory of his name, make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing praises to your name. Father, we worship and praise you in this season of the year. We're reminded this is the season that is... uh, as time that we celebrate the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ into our world, the first advent, and we anticipate the second advent as well. We just thank you, God, that you chose to intervene in our lives, that when we chose as sheep to go our own way and go astray, that you didn't leave us to our own devices. Rather, you chose to intervene and to give us the hope of a relationship with you that, that it leads to eternal life. And so, God, you are gracious and kind, and we, we, we uh, utter your praises, and we utter our gratefulness to you for all that you've done. We thank you that out of your love, you sent Jesus to redeem us, and we pray that you would forgive us for the times when we hold on to sin or engage in sin, which is the very thing that separates us from you. I want to give you, church, a time for just quiet, private reflection on this issue of holding on to sin. If there are things in your life that you know are detrimental, that are interfering with your relationship with your Heavenly Father, I just invite you to to leave those burdens with the Lord Jesus Christ at the foot of his cross and just take a moment to reflect and and release those things and ask for his forgiveness. The promise of 1 John 1, 9 is this, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from unrighteousness. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for that promise. Father, we pray for our ministry around the world through the Christian and Missionary Alliance in a place that we have uh, affectionately referred to as Long Beach. We pray for those folks over there who are seeking to make inroads into their communities through various means. We pray for your protection and for your encouragement and that they would see fruit from their labor and see people coming to know you. We ask for Janice Quinlan as well, who for many years has served you in Thailand and pray for your anointing and blessing on her. And God, we also think of the Lowers and Whitneys who serve you in Kenya and pray for your ministry to them and through them. Uh, these two families that we've been uh, connected to over the years because of members of our church. Pray for your blessing on them. And God, for Robert and Amy Childs who are serving you in Providence, that they would see good things happening, be encouraged as they seek to reach into this very difficult neighborhood with the good news of Jesus Christ. Father, for our country, we pray for our country. We are told in Scripture that we are to pray for those in authority over us, and so we do that. We pray for our president, our vice president, all in authority over us in Congress, our governor, all who have leadership, that you uh, would guide these men and women to make decisions that are in the best interest of this country, and that they would be men and women who are humbled before you and who are people of morality and integrity. Father, now we've heard of a new variant of COVID-19, and we pray for the leaders of our country and scientists and doctors who research how to treat that, to have wisdom and direction, and we pray for protection uh, as well on all of us that we would be able to function. Lord Jesus, we we pray that you would just uh, protect and, and guide us in this matter. And Father, we pray also for our church as we seek to reach out and show your love to our community. We pray for uh, the child care day next Saturday, that it would go well, that that mothers would respond to this offer and accept this help and be blessed by it. We also pray for our open house next Sunday, 
that it would be a time when people from our community will uh, come over and visit and uh, just have a good time fellowshipping and just uh, enjoying uh, this, this beautiful facility. So we pray your blessing on that. Father, we want to continue praying for Crystal Moore, whose uh, mother-in-law passed away suddenly, and pray for your ministry to, to this family, to her husband Chris, to Aiden, to all, to her father-in-law as well, as they face the, uh, the, the sadness of having lost this one that was so special to them. Please comfort them and give them your peace. Uh, thank you that Jerry's with us today. Help him as he continues to recover from surgery. We pray for Kevin Phillips, also recovering from knee replacement, for Pat as she continues her recovery, and for Sue Johnson, Father, as she injured her knee very badly, that you administer healing to her. And God, we also want to remember John Maley's mother, who has COVID, and pray for your ministry to her, and uh, just healing and strengthening of her body. Father, we also pray for Art and Gina can't be with us today because of exposure to COVID, and we pray that you would just protect them and uh, keep them healthy and strong, we pray. And for all who mourn loss, especially during this time of the holidays, for all facing physical hardship, Father, help us as a church to be who we can be in their lives, but we pray that you would also help them to experience your grace and your comfort and care and keeping. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Don't make me come up there. How many parents have uttered those famous words? The key to that is you have to live in a two-story house. That's one thing that has to happen. You have to live in a two-story house to make that work. But if you do, and you you think you've successfully tucked your kids into bed for the night, and you finally go down and have some quiet time to yourself, maybe falling asleep in front of a television program, which is what I would tend to do, and then all of a sudden you hear the unmistakable sound of screaming and yelling upstairs and trampolining off one's bed, and you think to yourself, oh, no, I thought it was done for the day. You go to the bottom of the stairs, and you, lay, you utter those infamous words, that imply negative consequences for noncompliance, don't make me come up there. As Adam and Eve were in the garden rebelling against God, I wonder if God felt something like that. You see, God created a perfect space, a perfect environment for us to live in, for us to grow in, for us to enjoy his company and his fellowship. And and Adam and Eve made a decision, and Satan interfered with that, planted doubts in their minds about God's goodness, doubts of questions about whether he really had their best interests at heart. And they chose to rebel against God, and that's when sin entered the story. And as God saw this unfolding, did he say to himself, don't make me come down there? But he did come down here. He came down here in the form of his son, Jesus Christ. And that's what the incarnation is all about. And that's what we're going to be looking at this Advent series, the theme of incarnation for the next several weeks. Uh, And... uh, I actually wrote a blog on it earlier this week. If you want to read that blog, it's on the website. You can have access to it. But in week one, we're going to look at, that's today, we're going to look at the promise of incarnation, that human beings messed up God's perfect plan and that God intervened and chose to pursue us tenaciously. Week two, we're going to look for the plan of incarnation, how that all unfolds throughout the course of history, God's plan for incarnation through his son, Jesus Christ. And then we're going to look at a different kind of direction on week three. We're going to look at partnership in incarnation. Partnership means that God invites us to partner with him in his plan to reach the world by helping us to be incarnate in our world. Now you say, Pastor Jim, we're already incarnate because we're here. Well, we're going to unpack what that means in a little more detail during week three and then week four. I'm two words I'm not sure where I've landed on, but they both start with P, so I can go either way. And that is the princi- principles of, of 
incarnation or the practicalities of incarnation, how we become incarnate in our world. And so today we're going to start by looking at the promise of incarnation, and we're going to look at three verses that have to do with that topic. And uh, the first uh, verse will tell us the why of incarnation, the why of incarnation. And that's going to be in Genesis 3, verse 15. Uh, Adam and Eve disobeyed God, and then God confronted uh, Adam and Eve about that. And what did Eve do? She did what we always do when we get in trouble. She blamed somebody else. She said, to quote Flip Wilson's character, Geraldine. Remember Geraldine from years ago? Some of you don't remember Geraldine, but Geraldine was great. She said, the devil made me do it. The devil made me do it. And uh, that's basically what Eve said. And so God said, well, I'm going to go ahead and put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and, and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. There's a lot being said there. This verse introduces the idea of God's intervention for his people. He will strike your, he will uh, crush your head and you will strike his heel. God plans to overcome Satan and evil in the end. And that's what he's saying there. Christ would have victory. And those are words that, that Paul actually reiterated later in Romans 16 verse 20 when he says, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The God of peace will crush Satan under your feet. That's a pretty decisive victory. A few years back, I came across this picture, and uh, does the picture show up? Oh, okay, there it is. It's not showing on that. Okay. Uh, I won't pay attention to that. Uh, this is a picture that I heard referred to in Christianity Today, and I became intrigued by it. Uh, It's entitled, Mary Consoles Eve, and it was done by a, a nun. Her name is Sister Grace Remington, and it's an interesting notion of, of... I apologize for that. I think my head changed shape since the last time I used this. Maybe I got a haircut. Maybe that's what it is. Hope you're all having a good time. <laughs> I know I am. <laughs> so Mary consoles Eve, this picture, and it's an interesting notion to imagine that Mary... The that Mary, the mother of Jesus, would actually console Eve. Interesting notion there that, that she would offer consolation to the woman who, with her husband, Adam, brought the fall of humanity that led to the sacrifice of her son. And yet that's what you see in this picture. And, and um, you see that Mary has a typical Virgin Mary garb on. That's probably not what Mary really wore in real life. She was a poor woman, so she probably had tattered garments that she was wearing. But this is fine for this representation. And you know what? Eve, notice what Eve is clad in. Her hair. Just her hair. And in Eve's right hand, notice what she's holding. She's holding the apple. That piece of fruit that was the thing that led to her demise and Adam's demise. And notice where her left hand is. It's resting on top of Mary's womb, which contains the source of forgiveness. So she has the source of guilt and shame in one hand, and she's got her hand resting on the source of forgiveness. Inside that womb is the, the baby that would give his life for the world. It's a remarkable picture, and I think of that idea of holding on to sin, and I was re reading this article by a fellow by the name of uh, 
Garrett uh, Johnson, he says, he studied the picture and made this observation. He said that sin has a strange effect on us. Up front, it offers us everything. In the end, however, it leaves us only shame and frustration. Still, for some bizarre reason, we tend to hold on to it. Isn't that a good message? For some bizarre reason. She's got that apple in her hand. Like it's anything more than trouble. That's what she's holding on to. But the other hand on Mary's womb. And the other part of that picture that you'll see here is that the serpent is coiled around Eve's leg, which is significant. And Mary's foot is crushing the head of the serpent. Now, it's not Mary that would crush the head of the serpent. It was Mary's son, Jesus Christ, that would crush the head of the serpent. But it's still that symbolism that 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 snake is going to be curled around us as long as we're alive. It's going to be after us. But ultimately, the head of the serpent will be crushed by the Lord Jesus Christ. And so God's perfect plan for creation uh, was interrupted by Satan's... uh, temptation of Adam and Eve and their acquiescence. They're giving in to disobedience, through disobedience. But God did not give up on us, but pursues us tenaciously. And that is why the incarnation uh, is what, what the incarnation is all about, the fall of humanity and God's tenacious desire to rescue us. The second uh, word today I want us to think about is in Genesis seven fourteen, and you heard James read this verse earlier. Therefore, the, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. This is in, in uh, Isaiah 7, verse 14, and it's during the, about the 8th century of, uh, of, of the nation of Israel. And there was a prophecy that had a bit of a double fulfillment, I guess you could say. The promise was made to Judah, the southern kingdom of Israel, that, that God would uh, intervene to a degree, Uh, The northern kingdom of Israel and the the nation of Syria, or Aram as it's called in the text, was trying to intimidate the nation of Judah. And so Ahaz, king of Judah, was seeking to establish um, an alliance with Assyria, the big mean brother from the north. And God is trying to dissuade him from doing that. And so Isaiah's words were an attempt to convince Ahaz, the king of Judah, to not join forces with Assyria. Assyria would be problematic throughout a long period of history there. He was telling his people to trust him in the midst of this difficult situation, to not turn to their own plans and schemes, but to turn to God. And the promised sign would confirm his activity for them. The enemies would be destroyed by Assyria. But it would happen after a virgin who is possibly Isaiah's second wife. Scholars conjecture that Isaiah's first wife had passed away, that he remarried, and that he uh, and and his second wife conceived and gave birth, and she gave birth to a son. And later, Matthew would translate what the word Emmanuel means. It's an important word. Not until Matthew 1, verse 23, do we learn what that word means in English, which is God with us. And that's when the the angel is speaking to Joseph about what's going on in his fiancée's life and body. And he says, she's going to have a son and he'll be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. God with us. There are words that foreshadow the birth of Jesus Christ. Not just about this current prophecy that was going on in Isaiah chapter 7 in the 8th century, but also foreshadowing the coming of Jesus Christ into our world. God with us. God with us. Three small words. Nine letters. Two nouns. A preposition. Grammarians will notice there's not even a verb in there, which means it's not even a sentence. It's a phrase. Packed full of meaning. God with us. God has come to dwell with us, to be with us. In fact, that word dwell is a word that uh, is significant because it means the idea of God 
tabernacling with his people like he did during the Old Testament, during their wanderings in the wilderness. You know, theologians like big words. They do. I don't count myself as a theologian. Theologians like big words. Here's one. It's actually two. Hypostatic union. Ah, that's a good one. Basically, it means that at the same time, simultaneously, Jesus Christ was 100% God and 100% man. And so they come up with a big word, hypostatic union, to describe that. But God, through the prophet Isaiah, used three little words, God with us. The how of incarnation, a virgin will be with child, will give birth to a son, and will be called Emmanuel, God with us. The final part of this uh, introduction today, introduction uh, to the Advent series, is the the what of incarnation. We're going to look at uh, Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6 in just a minute. But in verses 1 through 5, um, it says that, it tells us that the, the people were going through a difficult time there. And uh, there was darkness, they were walking in darkness, there was futility in their lives, but there was a promise that God's light would shine on them, the promise that God would intervene for his people. And he mentions the Midianites, as in a day of Midian's defeat, it says early in those verses. Now, that comes to us from Judges 6 and 7, where the people of the Midianite armies were pestering the people of Israel. And God chose a guy by the name of Gideon who was hiding out, afraid for his life. And God looked at him and said, you're going to deliver the people from the Midianites. And he said, who, me? What are you talking about? His name was Gideon. And God referred to him as mighty warrior. He was fear-filled. He was unknown. But God chose to use him. I'll tell a little story on myself. I was preaching on that text, Judges 6, story of Gideon, one time down in Danbury at the Chinese Alliance Church down there. And I was being, my, my message was being translated into Mandarin. And I'm preaching along. And when you preach in a foreign in, that's translated, you got to clean up all the idioms. You got to get rid of idioms because idioms don't translate and they don't make sense. So I said, I used the expression, I said, Gideon was a fraidy cat, a scaredy cat, I said. And I stopped, and I looked at my translator, and I said, what did that sound like? And he said, the cat was very frightened. <laughs> and I said, well, that isn't it. <laughs> That's not what I was trying to say. Got to be careful, the idioms. But here's Midian, uh, Gideon, rather, who's, who's scared. He's frightened, as any of us would be in that context. And God looks at him and says, you're a mighty warrior. And so it's a promise of God's intervention for his people. And it comes out in verse 6, verse that we also heard earlier. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He is our Wonderful Counselor. That means he's a perfect planner. He's got everything planned out for us. God's plan is to carry out his program to defeat the enemy, Satan, and reconcile the world to himself. Now, I'm a a bit of a planner. I understand that. That's a trait I inherited from my father, especially when I'm traveling. I I like to plan everything out. I like to know exactly what's happening, where I'm going, how I'm getting there. My wife is not that way. She likes to listen to the telephone telling her where she's supposed to turn. I like to know it way ahead of time where I'm supposed to turn. But she's proven to me time and time again that it's okay to do it that way, that nobody dies and we get there safely. But I still have this rebellion inside my spirit that says, I want to know 10 days before I leave exactly how this trip is going to happen. And she doesn't. When dad traveled, he had it all mapped out. And I was thinking to myself, I wonder how my father would have reacted to Waze or any of those other apps that direct you. He may have reacted like his son, which is shut up and leave me alone. 
I don't know. I'm just guessing. He never had one of those in his phone. He never had a phone like that. So um, anyway. But he knew where we were going to he knew where we were going to go. He knew where we were going to stay. I don't know. He might have known what restaurant we're going to eat in for all I knew. He was so careful in planning it all out. And so when I think about God as our perfect planner, I think, to my, I, I think of my father. And I think of how carefully he planned everything out. And so what, that planning gave us a great deal of confidence when we hopped in the car and traveled where we were traveling. God's got it, Dad's got it all figured out. So as we go through life, with all of its ups and downs and uncertainties, we know that God has a plan. Now, there's a popular verse in Scripture that I've, I've seen used in a number of contexts. It's a, it's a wonderful verse from Jeremiah 29, verse 11. But I don't think that people who cite the verse understand the context always. It's a wonderful verse. But as I said, it's got kind of a tricky context. And that is, it's written to the people of Israel who were in Babylonian captivity. These people had disobeyed God, and God was sending them for a 70-year time out. You've you got to go sit over there for 70 years because you're bugging me. That's not how he said it. That's how I would have said it. And off they go to Babylon, many of them. And, and then he's writing them a letter or communicating to them through the prophet Jeremiah. And he says these words that are very popular. He says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. God's all about planning. He's the perfect planner, the wonderful counselor. God is our wonderful counselor, and that means that he, his plan is to defeat the enemy that is out to get us and to and, and harm us. He's also our mighty God, which means he has the power to implement his plan. It's one thing to make plans. I can make plans, but can I always implement the plans that I make? God can implement the plans that he makes. In a familiar story there in 1 Samuel 17, we have this epic encounter of David and Goliath, that wonderful story that we all heard as children in Sunday school if we went to Sunday school as children. And it's a wonderful story about this little shepherd boy named David lining up against this huge giant of a man named Goliath. And Goliath's going to eat him for lunch, but David says, no, that's not what's going to happen. So he gets his five smooth stones, and he takes the the giant down with one stone. But before he does that, he says these words to Goliath. He says, all those gathered here will know that it is not by the sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. The only way David could go into that battle with that confidence because he knew it wasn't his fight. It wasn't his fight. Yes, he was the instrument God was using in that moment, but it was God's fight. And so think of the, the fights that you try to take on your own self and in your own strength. A lot of times they're not your fights. And you just need to relax and let God be God and implement his plan as mighty God. He also says he's our everlasting father. If we believe in Jesus Christ, put our trust in him, it says in scripture that he gives us the right to be called children of God. 1 John 3, 1, familiar passage. See what great love the father has lavished or poured out on us that we should be called children of God and that is what we are. And the final word there is that we are called, he is called prince of peace. That his rule, Christ's rule, will bring peace to our hearts, to our individuals, to society, by defeating our enemy and bringing God's kingdom. Another verse I want to reference is Romans 5, chapter chapter 5, verse 1, where it it tells us that, well, the whole chapter of 5, Romans, kind of builds a case that we are enemies of God. Now, I imagine most people would say, no, I'm not God's enemy. Even atheists, atheists aren't God's enemies because they don't believe there's anybody to be an enemy with. But Paul says, once we've entered, entered into a life of rebellion against God, which we all do, that we're enemies of God. But then he goes on to say this wonderful, reassuring word, 
Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace with God. Only possible through the Prince of Peace. Through Christ, we have peace with God as he took our sins. And so the enmity with God is removed. We have peace with ourselves because we're not you know, thwarted and defeated by guilt and shame because of what we've done. And we have peace with each other because we realize that we have commonality in the cross of Jesus Christ. That no matter how great and impressive our resume in this life look, works and looks, there's only one plea we have when we stand before God. And that is, we put our faith in Jesus Christ. We trust it in Him. That's our plea. And that's our source of peace. I think there's a little bit of a logical sequence in uh, that flow there in, in Isaiah 9.6. Because it says he's our wonderful counselor. He, he, he has a perfect plan in place for redemption of the world. He's our mighty God, which means he has the ability to implement that plan. And he's our everlasting father and prince of peace, which means that because of his implement, implementation of his redemptive plan, we have rights as children of God. And part of that is our access to peace. There's kind of a logical flow there in, in that sequence, I think. Did any of you as parents ever use that expression, don't make me come up there? I probably did. I've forgotten most of what I did when I was being a parent to small children. It's better that way, I think. God looked down from heaven and he saw his people rebelling against him like sheep going astray as Isaiah says in Isaiah 53. He saw all that and he didn't say, don't make me come down there. He simply did come down here. And he didn't come down to punish us. He came down to forgive us. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, we have been healed. The why of incarnation, a human rebellion, and God's tenacious desire to restore us into a right relationship with himself. The what of incarnation, he sent his son, born of a virgin, and he is God with us. The what of incarnation, Jesus is our wonderful counselor, our mighty God, our everlasting father and our Prince of Peace. Let's bow together and pray. Will you join me? I want to give you just a chance to think about and respond to God in His tenacious pursuit of you, His relentless pursuit of you. That's what the incarnation is all about. God could have looked down from heaven and say, I'm done with those people. They don't want anything to do with them, with me. I don't want anything to do with them. But that's not how it worked. God chose to condescend to us in love. If there's someone here today that has never entered into a personal relationship with God by faith in Christ, maybe... Maybe the words from Scripture today gave you just another glimpse into God's love for you. And I would invite you today to take that step of entering into a relationship with God by faith in Christ. We do that by acknowledging our sin and our fallenness, our need for forgiveness, and accepting Christ's forgiveness. And at the same time, letting go of the apple. We've got to let go of the apple, we've got to let go of the sin because that's going to conti continue to harm us and destroy us. Lord God, we thank you for this beautiful season of the year 
We remember the coming of Jesus Christ into our world to give his life away for us. Father, thank you that you are our everlasting Father, that you are our perfect planner, our mighty God, and our our Prince of Peace. Thank you for all that you do for us. Thank you for your amazing grace and your kindness. I pray that each one of us, as we go through this season, uh, would always reflect upon that basic truth of God with us. And now, Almighty God, send the light of your Son into our lives anew today. Let your presence touch our minds and hearts with your mercy, grace, and truth. Direct our thoughts, speech, and steps to the end that we may walk in your way today and always. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Well, I think the place looks great, doesn't it? Thank you for everyone who helped to do the decoration last Sunday. My help was saying, hey, that looks pretty good. It's the gift of encouragement. Some might interpret that as laziness, but I see it as encouragement. So thank you for everyone who who did the beautiful job decorating the place. It looks great. And we're all geared up for a couple of events coming up next Saturday. Uh, We have a day where we're offering child care for young mothers, single mothers in particular, between the hours of 1 to 4. And we've got a a crew lined up to volunteer to help us with that. Um, And if you know of somebody who would benefit from that, a young mother who's trying to keep things going and balls juggling in the air, would you please speak to Dottie? We need to know by Wednesday uh, who is going to be uh, taking advantage of that offering that we're giving next Saturday. It's one, again, next Saturday, December 4th from 12, I'm sorry, from 1 to 4 o'clock. Um, and then next Sunday, we have a little open house here at the church, so that's a time when you can invite friends and family in. We're going to have some caroling. Uh, We're going to have some cookies and coffee and tea and whatnot, and uh, possibly, I think we're having a a visit from a special guest um, who laughs ho, 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 or whatever it is he does, and he's going to come next uh, Sunday and tell us about the history of of, of St. Nicholas and point us to Jesus as well. So that's next Sunday, 3.30 to 5.30. Please encourage, I encourage you to come, invite your friends to join us. And uh, we do need some cookie bakers, so uh, Dottie's still upstairs, but she'll be coming down. And if you are willing to help with cookie baking, please let her know so that we make sure uh, we have enough cookies. I said, I said, we'll probably be fine. She said, well, she said, I'm Italian, and we have to have enough cookies. So I said, okay, I won't argue with that. So. Also, there's still a few angels on the back tree. Um, If you would like to take an angel with you, angel tree is uh, us buying gifts, Christmas gifts for children whose parents are incarcerated. And it's a lovely ministry of prison fellowship. So if you'd like to take one of those angels off the tree in the back, um, please just sign up for it. Let Pam Famigletti know that you're taking it and sign up so that we know who's got what angel. And we need to collect those gifts by December 12th. And uh, then they'll be distributed on the 18th. So if you want to help by buying a gift or by distributing a gift, uh, please speak to Pam at the end of the service. We will have second hour today. And so we look forward to a time of uh, reading and studying God's word together. I believe that's everything. God bless you and have a great day.